We're talking about the promises of God. Our theme verse is Hebrews 10.23. Here's what it says. So now we must cling tightly to the hope, or I might say the promise that lives within us, knowing that God always keeps his promise. If you've ever been on a float trip on the San Juan River to fly fish, you'll know that the boats are set up in a way where the guide is in the middle and there's a fisherman on each end of the boat. And the boats are built to keep the fishermen safe. They have something called leg locks. There's a pole that comes up and kind of a C shape uh, up on the top and you step into it and it locks your legs in so that if you hit rough water or if the boat shifts, you are able to cling to the boat to stay safe. A couple of years ago, I took some friends from Texas up to the San Juan uh, to fly fish, and uh, we had three boats. We were trying to stay close to one another so we could see how everyone was doing and cheer one another on and tease one another. And I, I remember I was fishing, and behind me, I heard a giant splash, and I, I looked behind me, and my friend had went head over heels over the boat directly into the river. We laughed about it, and we made sure he was safe and he got back in. Later, I was asking him what happened. He said, you know, I just, we'd been out on the river for a while. I got confident. I stepped out of the leg locks and, and, and the guy in the other end of the boat shifted his weight. When that happened, the boat rocked and I just, I just went over the edge. I, I want to ask you today, there's some promises of God. They're the leg locks for us that when we hit the rough water, when the boat shifts, we have something to hang on to. I have a question for you, especially if you're watching online today. I'm going to have you respond with an emoji. My question is this, have you ever ran out of gas? While you're driving your vehicle, have you ran out of gas? If you have, show me the emoji with the guy or the girl, you know, with the, the, head, the hand on his head like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I did this. Driving on empty is stupid. If you run out of gas, everyone knows that you weren't paying attention and it's an embarrassing mistake. It's a basic principle of driving. You've got to put gas in the car or it won't run. Several years ago, my family was on the way to Baton Rouge, Louisiana for Christmas. We go every other Christmas to Louisiana, and, and I made this mistake. I remember passing a gas station. I looked at the gauge. I saw that we were close to empty, but I thought, surely we can make it to the next gas station. So I continued to drive. Well, I didn't make it to the next gas station. All of a sudden, the, ga the car ran out. It began to, to sputter. I knew we were going to run out. We coasted over to the side. I looked around to figure out what we could do, and I saw across a big farm field, I saw a farmhouse and, and a barn and some tractors, and, and I just told Lisa, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hike over there and see if I can get us some help. So Lisa and the girls stayed in the car. I hiked across the field. I sheepishly knocked on the door of the farmhouse. The farmer came out. I said, sir, I'm sorry to bother you. My family, uh, we're stranded over here on the road because we've ran out of gas. He, he went to his barn and got a gas can and got some gas, and we, we literally got on his tractor. I don't know why we didn't drive one of his trucks. We got on his tractor. We drove around. I remember pulling up to Lisa and the girls on this farmer's tractor, and we got the gas in the car, and off we went on our way. If running on empty won't work with your car, why do we think it will work with our life? Some of you are currently living your life on empty. You're tired, you're exhausted, you feel like you have nothing left to give. You might be one situation away from shutting down. Sometimes it seems like there's nothing you can do about this. 2020 seems to be one of those years. It's like 2020 has thrown everything it can at us. I've got some pictures that I'll show you to illustrate 2020. The first one is the picture on a playground of a slide, and it just says this, if 2020 were a slide, and if you're looking at this with me right now, I think you see how appropriate it is. It's, it feels like in mid-March, we just fell off the edge 
of the slide. Or, or here's one from a great movie, The Princess Bride. If, if, you, if you love that movie, just throw me a fist bump in there right now. And it just says this, uh, waking up uh, every morning is like this. You're asking the question, where are we? Oh yes, in the pit of despair. How, how appropriate. How about this? We, we know uh, if, if our phone's not working, if the computer's not working, this is what we try. Have we tried unplugging 2020, waiting 10 seconds and plugging it back in? If only that would work. And here's one more. 2020 is a unique leap year. It has 29 days in February, 300 days in March, and five years in April. Are we there yet, right? 2020 has been one of those years. Regardless of the reason, many are running on empty with nothing left to give. How do you know if you're running on empty and on the verge of a breakdown? Cars have gauges. We may or may not pay attention to them, but they're there. They tell us how much gas we have and how fast we're driving and, and how our oil pressure is and how hot the engine is. And, and they help us to see how our car is doing. But what about us? What about our gauges? How do we know how we're doing? Let, let me give you a few. There's some physical gauges we can pay attention to. Things like, I'm always tired. Uh, I can't sleep at night or on the other end of the spectrum. I can't seem to get enough sleep. I have constant headaches. My blood pressure is unexplainably high. There's some psychological uh, gauges to pay attention to. I fight any change. I'm not as flexible as I used to be. I'm cynical and negative. I'm emotionally exhausted. I'm irritable. I'm impatient. I struggle to make even the smallest decisions. I'm constantly worried and anxious. Or some behavioral gauges. I've lost enthusiasm for my job, my marriage, my kids, my ministry. Uh, I'm, I'm using alcohol or drugs or prescription drugs or, or, or some other thing in order to cope. I, I struggle to focus or concentrate. I'm withdrawing from relationships with others. And finally, some spiritual gauges. I'm questioning my faith, my values. I'm not interested in church or ministry. I'm spending less time in prayer and in the Bible. Uh, I blame others uh, and make excuses for my lack of spiritual growth. Some of you completely identify with some of these gauges. You just, you're at the end, emotionally, physically, spiritually, relationally, and financially. Empty and headed for a crash. Running on empty is dangerous. So what do you do? How do we refill? How do we avoid the inevitable crash. The world says that the way to deal with burnout is just to, just to drop out. But that is a short-term fix because eventually life resumes and when it does, things quickly get hard again. Listen, you can't drop out forever. So what is the long-term solution? For the answer, we look to the Bible. Specifically today, we go to the book of Isaiah where we find a promise of God that speaks directly to these moments in our lives where we find ourselves running on empty, having nothing to give. The book of Isaiah is found in the Old Testament. It's written by the prophet Isaiah. He writes to the Jews, and Isaiah was considered one of the greatest prophets the story of Isaiah takes place about 700 years before Jesus was born. During the time of Isaiah's ministry, there were great challenges for God's people. There were wars and destruction and rebellion. Eventually, after years of invasion and conflict, the, the region that they occupied is conquered by Babylon. When this happened, being a Jew in Babylon became increasingly difficult. Life was extremely hard. They were forced to live outside of Judah as exiles. They're away from their home. They're living in captivity. The people of God were living on empty. They were beginning to doubt God's power. They were asking questions like, where is God? I thought he was all powerful. How could he allow this to happen to us. I imagine there've been a lot of people, maybe you're watching today, and you have asked similar questions over the last few months. If that's you, today's promise is for you. 
Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26, Isaiah says this. He says, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. If you're watching online, this might feel kind of awkward, but do me a favor, wherever you're watching from right now, and just look up. Uh, if you're in your living room, it's kind of boring. You're just looking at the ceiling. Maybe, maybe you're outside right now. you got a better view. But this is what Isaiah says. He says, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Many of you know that I love going to the mountains. One of the best parts of going to the mountains is when it gets dark, there's, there's not any ambient light. There's not the city lights that, that, that we have you know, here in the, in the city around our homes. And so when it gets dark, it gets really dark. And all of a sudden, it's like the sky just comes alive. I mean, it's like the stars feel like they've come in closer. Almost you can reach out and just grab one of them. I, I love when I, I'm able to, to, to catch a, a shooting star. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. One of the things that fascinates me is how the moon phase will affect things like the tide or animal movements. Just, just think about this. Back in Isaiah's time, they didn't know all that we know about space, but they were still amazed. The stars, the planets, the galaxies, it's unbelievable. It seems like today, the more we discover, the larger space gets. I mean, the, the, we're pushing constantly out to the edges of what we know, and then we discover something else. This is why Isaiah directs the people of God to look up. He says, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. And then he asks this question, who created all these he who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them name by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Our, our daughter Ava really likes space. Maybe, maybe some of you do as well. She came home uh, the other day with a new face mask and she said to me, she said, Dad, I love this face mask because it looks like an exploding nebula. I didn't really know what that meant, but I said, baby, I'm happy for you. That's a beautiful mask. What, what she's saying is, it reminds me of when I look into space, when I, when I look and I see, it, it's just, it's amazing. Listen, this is a reminder to the people of God when you're running on empty. Every time you doubt God's power, this is something we can do, like physically, is we look up and we're reminded of the power of God. <laughs> I don't think Isaiah was talking metaphorically or poetically. He's literally telling them, go outside and look up. As a follower of Jesus, what we see in the sky is a validation of just how God big is, how, how God big is, how big God is. God is larger than life. He's bigger than anything you could ever imagine. He created the stars. I love how Isaiah puts it. He brings out the starry night one by one. He calls them by name. It's as if as, as night comes, he's placing the stars exactly where he wants them. He knows each of the stars. He puts it all together. I'll just tell you this. If God knows every star by name as he puts them uh, in, in their place in space, here's what I know, he'll never forget my name. He knows my name, he knows my purpose, he knows my place, he knows what I'm going through. I'm telling you today, he knows your name, he knows your place, he knows your purpose, he knows what you need right now. Listen, I know that this season has been hard. I know that this, it's like the entire world has been turned upside down. Everything seems to be falling apart. Here's what Isaiah says. Look up. Look up. God has not forgotten you. Look up. God has not abandoned you. The, the last few months might have been scary, but we can look up and we're reminded that God is powerful. Look up. God is he's faithful. Look up. God is not finished with us. Isaiah continues in verse 27. It says, why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. In other words, Lord, have you forgotten me? I mean, don't you hear me? Don't you hear my prayers? Don't you know what's going on? 
There's a lot of people in the world that are asking those questions the last couple of months. Uh, There's so much discouragement and, and desperation. And verse 28 says this, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In ancient times, Gods and goddesses were viewed as having human weakness. They were believed to get tired or hungry uh, and and ignore the events that were happening on earth because uh, of of their weariness. You might remember when Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. There were 450 prophets that came together. They built an altar, uh, and from morning till noon, they called out to their God for fire to light this altar, but no nothing happens. And Elijah responds in 1 Kings 18. He says, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. He says, shout louder. (laughs) He's taunting them. He says, surely he's a God. Perhaps he's in in, in deep thought, or maybe he's busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping, and you just need to awaken him. This was their view of God. He has weakness, just like you and I do. You might feel today, because you're worn out, (laughs) that maybe God is worn out. So some of you may feel like that, that maybe God is tired of rescuing you. Maybe God is, is worn out. <laughs> Listen, can I just help you today? God who put the stars in the sky, he has the strength to, to carry out whatever needs to happen. Listen, God does not get tired. There's never a moment where God says, oh, I need a break. Listen, what makes us weary doesn't make God weary. There's a lot happening in our world today to make us weary. You may be tired, but I promise you, God does not get weary. Verse 30 says, even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Right now, the pressure of everything that we're facing, it's just, it just wears us down. I think everyone is experiencing it. You may struggle to sleep because of the pressure, or you may want to sleep too much because of the pressure. The pressure is like a weight that just keeps pressing down on us day after day. According to a recent report from Express Scripts, the use of an anti-insomnia, anti-anxiety, and antidepressants spiked 21% from February to March. And we all know what happened in March. I keep hearing people say these words, I'm just tired. It's said in a lot of different ways. <laughs> I'm tired of being afraid. I'm tired of wearing a mask. I'm tired about worrying if I'm going to get sick. Uh, we're, we're, just, we're just getting tired. What, what do people do when they get tired? There, there's all kinds of ways it affects us. Uh, we get mad at people. Our fuse becomes shorter. We, we lash out. We, 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 we get so tired that we don't know how to respond. And so these emotional responses just come out of us. A lot of relational problems and dysfunctional behaviors happen because you're worn out. We get tired when it doesn't seem like there's going to be a payoff. We get tired when we don't see results. We get tired when we feel alone. We get tired when we can't see the end. We we, we don't see an end in sight. So when you're weary, here's the promise. Verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. I grew up learning this verse in the King James Version. It says this, but those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. I I don't know about you, but I don't like waiting. I I don't actually know if anyone likes waiting, but this current season has us waiting more than we would like. Fast food isn't fast anymore because everyone is in the drive-thru. If you order on Amazon, there's no such thing as prime shipping. Two-day shipping became two-week shipping. Or in our case, uh, Pastor Tyler and I ordered something this week for the church, and we got the notification it would be here in two months. I mean, there's no such thing. Now we have to wait. Some of you are waiting to come back to church. Many of you are waiting to go back to work. Students are waiting to go back to school, and now that's been pushed back even farther. We're we're not real good at waiting. So Isaiah says, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. What does it look like to wait 
on the Lord? What do you do while you're waiting on the Lord? I'll just give you one quick, super practical help. When you're waiting on the Lord, don't do something on your own. Listen, waiting is the action. We get confused. We think waiting is passive. And because we're waiting, we can go over here and try to do something on our own. But I just want you to know, waiting is the thing to do. Stop trying to figure out the solution. We try to, to overthink it and engineer it and come up with the, the solution. Resist the urge to fix things. Do not put your hands back on the steering wheel. Just wait. Because that's the promise. If you will wait, God says, instead of trying to do it on your own, I will renew your strength. He says this. He says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, they will soar on wings like eagles. I don't know if you've ever seen an eagle in the wild. I've had the chance several times, and they are majestic birds. They are beautiful and fun to watch. So I'll go back to where Isaiah started. He said this. He said, lift up your eyes and look. Look up. This time, not at night, but this time in the day. What he's saying is, look at the eagle and watch how it flies. Watch how it soars. If, you, if you've ever watched an eagle, they're not frantic. <laughs> they're not flapping their wings and, and working hard. I mean, in fact, it almost looks effortless. They soar high above the earth. Uh, they, they glide on the up currents, the up drafts uh, uh, of the world. They just, they just glide. But many of you if I'm honest, especially in this last several months, I don't know a lot of believers that look like eagles who are just soaring high above the troubles of the world. And, and, and I'll give you a different image. Many people look like a hummingbird. Not an eagle, but a hummingbird. My mom has a hummingbird feeder outside of the kitchen window. So we've been watching them a lot lately. There's fascinating little birds. In fact, the other day I recorded one. I used the slow-mo feature on my phone and I recorded one and I watched it back. And even in slow motion, they're incredibly fast. I don't know if you know this, but a hummingbird flaps its wings 70 times a second. That's 4,200 times a minute. And listen, as I'm thinking about the eagle, and Isaiah says, you wait on the Lord, I'll renew your strength. You'll soar like the eagle. But, but I think what the church looks like right now is not like an eagle that's effortlessly gliding in the sky, but instead we look like, like flapping our wings 700 times, 4,000 times. We're, just, we're trying so hard to figure it out. We're trying so hard. Let's solve our own problems. Let's work harder. Let's work faster. Let's do more. Let's try. Let's work. And the promise of God is this. If you wait on the Lord, you'll renew your strength. When you hope in the Lord, you glide on the upcurrents of the grace of God. You're high above the troubles of the world. The winds of God's mercy and grace carry us through life's journey. You won't just fly, but you will soar. It says this. It says, they'll soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. You'll walk and not be faint. Now, this does not mean that you can go and run 10 miles and not get tired. I actually wish that's what it, it meant. Uh, uh, you know, during uh, COVID-19, many have picked up uh, 19 pounds or, or so. So I, I've started working out again. And oh my goodness, it's just, I've been so sore. I've been so tired. I'm kind of in the phase right now of why am I putting myself through this? Like, what in the world? am I doing? Like, I, I wish this promise, or, you know, we're like, I will work out and not get sore. I will work out and, and, and not be weary. But that, that's not what, he's not talking about exercise. He's not talking about weight loss. He's not talking, he's talking about life. He's talking about the, the journey that we go through in life. L listen to me. Burnout happens when we try to accomplish God's plan in our own power. Some, some of you need to get this today. 
Burnout happens when we strive like the little hummingbird, flapping our wings as fast as we can to accomplish what God has called us to do, but we're not in operating in his strength, but we're relying completely on ourselves. Listen, when you are waiting on society, on people, on banks, on anything else for the answers other than God, you are going to wear yourself out. When you're waiting on the Lord, when your hope is in the Lord, you can go further, you can go longer, and you can go faster than if you did it on your own. So the very thing that we don't want to do, to wait, the very thing that that we despise when we get in the fast food line or when, when we order something online. The very thing that we don't like is actually the secret here that when we wait, God gives us the ability to keep going. He renews our strength. He renews our energy. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus talks about all the bad things that are going to happen in this world. He talks about wars and uprising nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, uh, famines, pestilence, fearful events, persecution, great distress. It says this, people will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. That verse just is so, it, it means so much today. There's so much apprehension. Can I leave my house can I go to work? Can my kids go to school? Can we, you know, can we do this? There, there's so much terror and fear in the world. But, but here, here's, I want you to hear this in verse 28. So Jesus talks about all these bad things that are going to happen. Verse 28, oh my goodness, so encouraging. He says, when these things begin to take place, pointing back at all the bad stuff that's happening, he says, stand up and lift up your head. Sounds kind of like Isaiah, right? Look up, lift up your eyes, look to the heavens. Jesus says, stand up and lift up your heads. Watch this, because your redemption is drawing near. Your redemption is dry. Listen, here's what I'm telling you. I know that the news feed is full of negative news. In fact, I'll say it this way. I have unfollowed more people in this last season than ever in my life because I am I'm trying to filter out the negativity and the voice. I'm just so tired of it. Listen, it's, it's, the, it's the social media. It's the news stations. It's everywhere. I know that you're inundated with bad news. Here's what I want you to hear today. When all of the bad stuff is going on, stand up, lift up your heads because redemption Redemption is drawing near. I've come today to ask you to look up. When things are falling apart, look up. When tension is high and our government can't seem to figure it out and they can't get together and make decisions and work together, look up. When there's division, look up. Up. When the doctor calls and the news is not good, look up. When you are running on empty, When the world is full of chaos, when the governor gives an update that you don't like, when the school board makes a decision that you don't agree with, look up. I just love this. Day or night, when you look up, you are reminded that God is good. We're reminded that God is strong. We're reminded that God loves us. We're reminded that God gives us strength. So today... If you are running on empty, some of you, I mean, you're just on fumes. My, my, my wife um, loves to see how far she can get with a, with a tank of gas. I, I don't usually let it go that close, even though I told you the story earlier of running out. That's I, I, very rare for me. But my wife, I mean, she, you'll see the numbers. Some of your cars, it counts down for you. It's like, you know, 10 miles to empty, five miles to empty, one mile to empty. And, and, and I've always found it curious that certain cars will literally start saying zero miles to empty. But, you know, people like my wife know there's a buffer built in there and they've got a couple more miles to make it to the gas station. That may be where you are today. You are running on fumes. Maybe you're coasting and you're looking ahead for the gas station to fill your heart up again. Here's what I want to say to you today. Look up. 
we're going to go back into one worship song. And as we do, I have been praying all week that in these final moments that your tank is refilled. That as we wait on the Lord, I, I want to encourage you. I don't know what you do normally when it goes to the worship time, but I want to encourage you. Don't sign off right now. Don't get up to freshen up your coffee. Don't just re resist the urge. Do nothing but wait. Wait on the Lord and renew your strength. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray for friends right now who are running on empty. God, over the next couple of minutes, we're just going to wait. And as we do, I just pray this promise over my friends that we would be renewed in our strength, in our energy. Lord, I'm so thankful that you are a God who does not grow weary. There's so much weariness around us today, but, but that's not you. You are a strong, capable, able God. And today I pray for my friends that you would take care of us in every need that we have. In Jesus' name, amen.